Chairman, who have given us exciting discussions on cardiac morphology and embryology for the past uh, few months. I'll just take some of the announcements of Congenital Cardiac Heart Academy. Kindly follow us on all our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also, please subscribe to our Congenital Heart Academy YouTube channel. We have so many um, participants subscribed, and you'll have the opportunity to see a lot of our lecture series and discussions that you ha may have missed over the past few months. Dr. Gil Venosky's lecture series also come up on Tuesdays. We had an exciting time on September the 29th, and the next one comes up on October the 13th, and we'll be discussing the systematic approach to postoperative neonates and infants with congenital heart disease. It's pretty much like a worldwide word round where we'll get to discuss why things are done differently in different parts of the world. We also iron out some controversies and we look at potential future directions for the care of patients with congenital heart disease. It's always an exciting time. So please make our time to join us this Tuesday and also November the 10th, December the 8th, and also more to come in 2021. We are also starting our Nightmare Cases webinar classroom, which res resumes or starts on Thursday, October 15th. And we'll be looking at the management of complex congenital heart disease. And this week we'll be starting from Aswan Cardiac Center, Magdi Yaqub Foundation in Egypt, um, North Africa. And we'll be discussing with Dr. Mohammed. Um, Gabriel and Dr. Hatem Hosni, and it will be an exciting time where we look at the management, preoperative and also surgical management of complex heart disease. So kindly make out time to join us. Professor Anderson's classrooms also continue um, on Fridays. There is a change to this. Um, we will be taking isomerism on October the 16th and anomalous venous drainage on October the 23rd. So please always make our time on Fridays. It's always an exciting time correlating cardiac morphology and embryology to our real life um, patients. It's always an honor on Mondays when we have Professor Norman Silverman um, doing the imaging series where we get to correlate cardiac morphology with echocardiography. And we have had several sessions which have really been enlightening and it brings real life into echocardiography images. And we'll be discussing two Tuesdays from now, October the 19th, we'll be discussing ventricular septal defect for one hour. And please kindly make our time to join us on Monday. So please um, put in your questions in the Q&A box and then um, we would have the answers to questions after our lectures. We'll now hand over to Professor Robert Anderson. Thank you. So what we are going to discuss is straddling of the atria ventricular valves. But I'm going to start off with discussing with you the difference between atria ventricular valves and arterial valves because part of straddling is overriding and arterial valves can also override. So we need to start by discussing the difference between overriding and straddling. And there you are, that will be the topic for the start of our discussion. I'll then discuss with you the differences that we find when it is the mitral valve that is straddling as opposed to the tricuspid valve. And then we have to discuss the problem as to whether common valves also straddle. We know they override, but within the definitions we're going to outline, is it the case that atrioventricular valves also straddle? I'm going to discuss with you the significant differences in the setting of right-handed as opposed to left-handed ventricular topology. And then I will complete today's discussions by going to that very interesting entity in which we have absence of an atrioventricular connection, but straddling of the solitary atrioventricular valve. Because as I will explain, that produces the uniatrial, but biventricular atrioventricular connection. But let's start by looking at the similarities and differences between atrioventricular 
and arterial valves. So what do the sets of valves have in common? Well, they both have leaflets. And the leaflets guard junctions. Obviously, the atrioventricular level, the leaflets guard the atrioventricular junctions. At the ventricular arterial level, it follows they guard the ventricular arterial junctions. But the two sets of valves also have key differences. And the major difference is that the atrioventricular valves have tension apparatus. And that, of course, is to stop them blowing inside out under the full tension of ventricular systole. It's also the case that the hinges of the atrioventricular valves are relatively annular, whereas the hinges of the arterial valves are arranged in semilunar fashion. But those differences are less significant for today's discussion. What is much more significant is the arrangement with regard to tension apparatus, because it is the presence of the tension apparatus that gives us the potential not only to have straddling, but also overriding. Because the tension apparatus can be attached on both sides of the muscular ventricular septum. And it is that that we define as straddling, the tension apparatus crossing the septum. The junctions, in contrast, override the septum. And then, the two junctions are shared between the ventricles, and because of that, we have a spectrum of malformation. Now, the arterial valves can only override, whereas atrioventricular valves can both straddle and override. So let's look first at the essence of override in the setting of an arterial valve. So here, I hope you'll recognize I'm showing you the arrangement of the aortic valve in the setting of tetralogy fallow. It's a four-chamber cut, and there very nicely you see the crest of the muscular ventricular septum. You also see the circumference of the aortic root. And as you know, in tetralogy fallow, one of the features is the aortic root overrides the ventricular septum. And then in the setting, this override part of the aortic root is looking into the right ventricle. The other part is looking into the left ventricle. And depending on how much of the valve looks into the right or the left ventricle, we determine the ventricular arterial connections. And in this particular instance, both, most of the aortic valve is committed to the left ventricle. And so we have concordant ventricular arterial connections. But you all know that it is difficult to determine the precise degree of override looking in the long axis. So I've already shown you in our previous classroom when we discussed tetralogy fallow, how much more accurate nowadays it is to determine the degree of override by looking down the barrel of the aortic root and assessing the cord of the ventricular septum relative to the circumference of the root. root. And this beautiful picture prepared by Tony Lovacek from Medical University of South Carolina, we see that in this instance, the aortic root is more or less equally committed between the ventricles, but still we would give it to the left ventricle and we would deem that this patient also had concordant ventricular arterial connections. So that's how we deal with the overriding junction in the setting of the arterial valves. So there is a spectrum of override, and that spectrum will determine the precise connections. So at the ventricular arterial level, we move from one to one, as we've seen in tetralogy, concordant ventricular arterial connections to double outlet right ventricle. At the atrioventricular junctions, we then have a similar spectrum. And once more, we move from one to one ventricular, uh, atrioventricular connections. But this time, the other end of that spectrum is double inlet ventricle. And that is why 
Straddling valves or individuals with straddling valves are so important in determining this watershed between the functionally biventricular and the functionally univentricular heart. So let's explore that in a little more detail. So here is a four chamber cut showing you the situation when we have straddling and overriding of the tricuspid valve. In this particular instance, you see the overriding right atrioventricular junction, and we have to assess the relationship between the overriding junction and the crest of the muscular ventricular septum. And in this instance, most of that overriding connection is committed to the right ventricle, with a smaller part committed to the left ventricle. So here we have concordant atrioventricular connections. But then, depending on the degree of override, we can move towards the other end of the spectrum. I'm going to show you these pictures again. But this is a heart that was prepared by my good friend and colleague, Lodovic van Meerop, who throughout his career worked at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And he's windowed the right atrium in this particular heart so that, as Tony Lavarchek showed you in the setting of Tetralogy, here in straddling tricuspid valve, you can look down on the overriding valvar orifice. So there is the overriding orifice. And now, by taking the cord subtended by the crest of the muscular ventricular septum, you can determine how much of the circumference of the tricuspid valvar orifice is connected to left ventricle as opposed to right ventricle. So clearly, in this instance, more of the overriding right atrioventricular junction is committed to left ventricle. So because of that, and because we know the mitral valve in this heart is also committed to the left ventricle, we have double inlet left ventricle. And so we have the spectrum. What I'm going to emphasize is the key to understanding the arrangement that we find in the setting of straddling valves. So here we're looking at straddling tricuspid valve. And the first heart I showed you had the greater part of the straddling junction committed to the right ventricle, giving us concordant atrioventricular connections. The second heart I showed you, however, had the greater part of the straddling and overriding right atrioventricular junction committed to the left ventricle. And that means that along with the left atrioventricular valve being committed to the same ventricle, we had double inlet left ventricle. But it also means that the second chamber in the heart is more incomplete, but it remains a morphologically right ventricle. And that is why hearts with double inlet left ventricle are not univentricular hearts. In a recent presentation, I gather it was suggested that we could have true single ventricles to include double inlet left ventricle. That is a contradiction to what we see in terms of the morphology, because it would be a nonsense to say that as soon as more of the straddling atrioventricular valve gets into the left ventricle, the chamber supporting less of that valve ceases to be a right ventricle. And indeed, it was this recognition that the degree of override changes the connection, but does not change the morphology of the small ventricle that was the key to us appreciating the importance of the functionally univentricular arrangement. So it is a contradiction to anatomy to suggest that we can have true single ventricles when unequivocally there are two chambers present, one being a morphologically right ventricle, the other being a morphologically left ventricle. And we're going to see that again and again as we look at the variations we find in the setting of straddling 
atriocentric valves. So what I've shown you is that straddling atrioventricular valves can not only override, but they also straddle. And indeed, most of the valves we see in this situation do both straddle and override. But rarely, valves can straddle without overriding. And on other rare occasions, they can override without straddling. So straddle and override are independent features. Here I've turned my attention to the left atrioventricular valve because we're also going to look at the difference between tricuspid and mitral valves. But my drawing now is showing you how the orifice of the left atrioventricular valve is overriding the crest, the muscular ventricular septum, and that is the essence of override. But also, the tension apparatus is attaching to either side of the crest of the septum, and that is the essence of straddling. So in most instances, as I've already stated, these valves will both override and straddle. But here is the situation where the junction is overriding relative to the crest of the septum, but now all of the tension apparatus is committed to the left ventricle. So there, in fact, is no straddling, although, as you see from the arrows, there is still a degree of override. And this is the other end of the situation where the override is such that there remains a little bit of tension apparatus committed in the incomplete ventricle, giving us overriding in no overriding rather in the presence of straddling but still even in this setting that small chamber remains a ventricle and that is why even the patients with extreme override still have anatomically biventricular hearts with univentricular atrioventricular arrangements so let's move on and let's look at the difference between straddling mitral valves, straddling tricuspid valves. Remember, remembering that in most instances, these valves are also overriding. And the key difference is that the tricuspid valve overrides and straddles between the inlets. The tension apparatus straddles the posterior end of the muscular ventricular septum whereas the mitral valve overrides and straddles into the outlet of the right ventricle. And then there are spectrums, as we have discussed, depending upon the degree of override. So let's move back to the spectrum we've already discussed. And then the spectrum we see in the setting of straddling and overriding of the tricuspid valve. And there it is. The overriding tricuspid valve or orifice, you've seen this before. And so now it is straddling and overriding between the inlets. Here, on the other hand, we see the situation with the mitral valve. And the mitral valve now is straddling towards the outlet of the right ventricle. And here in a different heart, you see what's happening when it straddles into the outlet of the morphologically right ventricle. In this instance, the mitral valve is not only overriding and straddling, it is also cleft. So can a common valve also straddle? We know that the common valve overrides because that is what we see in the setting of atrioventricular septal defect with common junction. But we know also that we can have double inlet through a common valve. So there we have the situation where there may be no override, but still there can be straddling. And once more, there is a spectrum between extremes. So here we see the situation in a balanced atrioventricular septal defect. The junction is overriding equally between the two ventricles, but unequivocally. The tension apparatus of the superior and the inferior bridging leaflets is straddling. 
That is why they are bridging leaflets. There you see the straddling, in this instance, of the inferior bridging leaflet. But here is the situation where we have a common atrioventricular junction draining both the right atrial chest, but draining exclusively into the right ventricle. So we can have the situation where common valves override, but still they can straddle. So let's now look at the influence of ventricular topology. You all know that we can have right-handed or we have left-handed ventricular topology. When we have usual H arrangement, and in the setting of right-handed topology, it is the tricuspid valve that connects to the right-sided morphologically right ventricle. The mitral valve connects to the left-sided morphologically right, sorry, the left mitral valve to the left-sided morphologically left ventricle. That is a mistake on my slide, which I apologize. In left-handed topology, the tricuspid valve goes with the ventricle. So now the tricuspid valve is connected to the left-sided right ventricle. The mitral valve is connected to the right-sided left ventricle. Again, a mistake on my slide, for which I apologize. The key here is that the ventricular topology determines the atrioventricular connections depending on the extent of override. So let's look at what happens with these different combinations. And let's start again by looking at straddling of the tricuspid valve in the setting of right-handed ventricular topology. Because now, if most of the overrided junction is to the right ventricle, as we have already seen, we have concordant atrioventricular connections. But as we have also seen, if most of the overriding junction is connected to the left ventricle, because the left ventricle is also receiving the mitral valve, we have double inlet left ventricle, but key feature, we have double inlet left ventricle with a right-sided incomplete right ventricle. We still have a biventricular heart, because we have a morphologically right ventricle, a morphologically left ventricle, but we have a functionally univentricular arrangement now because of the double inlet atrioventricular connections. So let's look at the spectrum again. Here is the situation where only a small part of the straddling and overriding tricuspid valve is connected in the left ventricle. Most of the overriding junction is going to the morphologically right ventricle. Hence, as we've already discussed, concordant atrioventricular connections. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. And now only a small part of the straddling and overriding valve is connected into that incomplete right ventricle but it remains a right ventricle. And you've seen these before, here with concordant atrioventricular connections, and here with double inlet left ventricle, because most of the overriding junction is committed to the left ventricle along with the mitral valve. But that does not alter the fact the anterior superior ventricle in this setting remains a right ventricle. The heart remains anatomically biventricular, and it is a fundamental mistake to consider this as a true single ventricle. It is a functionally univentricular heart, but anatomically, unequivocally, it is biventricular. And we're going to see this again and again. And the pathognomonic feature of straddling tricuspid valve is malalignment between the atrial septum relative to the ventricular septum. This is important for the surgeons because it predicts that there will be an abnormal dis disposition of the atrioventricular conduction axis. We've discussed this in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition. 
because we know that the atrioventricular node is formed where the muscular ventricular septum meets the atrioventricular junction. And in the setting of malalignment, it is no longer in the triangle of cock. So the bundle is carried on the septal crest, and it can create potential problems during surgical repair. Because if the surgeon goes in and he sees this situation of straddling and overriding of the tricuspid valve, then he or she must remember that the connecting node is no longer in the triangle of cock, but instead it is formed where the muscular ventricular septum meets the atrial ventricular junction. But we can also, as we've discussed, have straddling tricuspid valve in the setting of left-handed ventricular topology. So here, in essence, we're talking about a spectrum involving congenitally corrected transposition. Because now the spectrum is going to be from discordant atrioventricular connections to double inlet left ventricle. But in the setting of double inlet, the incomplete right ventricle will now be left-sided. So always in this setting, the conduction axis is going to be abnormal. But still, the atrioventricular node will be in the right atrioventricular junction. So let's first of all look at the spectrum. Remember now, it is the left-sided atrioventricular valve that is straddling over and overriding, but it is morphologically tricuspid because we have left-handed ventricular topology. So when most of the overriding junction is connected to the left-sided morphologically left ventricle, as you see here, we have discordant atrioventricular connections. So this is congenitally corrected transposition with straddling tricuspid valve. And oftentimes in this setting, the right ventricle is hypoplastic, but making even worse the situation that it is incapable of pumping the systemic circulation. So here is correct. transposition did and is supporting the pulmonary trunk and there in this particular heart you see the straddling tricuspid valve the septum is no longer reaching to the crooks so that is why in this setting straddling tricuspid valve we have an anomalous anterior superior atrioventricular node and the conduction axis is running anterocephalad both to the pulmonary valve and to the ventricular septal defect through which the tricuspid valve is straddling. But here then is the other end of the spectrum. So now we still have left handed ventricular topology. So the incomplete right ventricle is now left sided. It's supporting the minor part of the overriding and straddling left atrioventricular junction. So we have double inlet left ventricle, but now with left-sided, incomplete right ventricle. Still, it is a right ventricle, and still it is an anatomically biventricular heart, but with univentricular atrioventricular connection because of the double inlet. So let's now look at what happens when the mitral valve is straddling. And let's first of all think what happens in the setting of right-handed ventricular topology. Because now, because we have right-handed topology, when most of the mitral valve is connected to the left ventricle, there will still be concordant atrioventricular connections. If, however, most of the valve overrides into the right ventricle, then obviously we will now have double inlet right ventricle. And that means the left ventricle, which will be left sided, will be incomplete. But because the mitral valve is straddling to the outlet right ventricle, the septum still reaches to the crooks, so there will be a regular conduction axis. And this is the arrangement we typically see in the setting of the Tausig-Bing malformation. So let's look at the spectrum. 
So here is the better end of the spectrum. The minor part of the mitral valve is straddling into the outlet of the right ventricle. The greater part still committed to the left ventricle. So we retain concordant atrioventricular connections. This is the other end of the spectrum with only a minor part of the straddling and overriding mitral valve now remaining within the left ventricle. The greater part is going into the right ventricle, hence giving us double inlet right ventricle, but with an incomplete left ventricle. It makes no sense at all to say that this is a true single ventricle because it still has a morphologically left ventricle position posterior inferiorly within the ventricular mass. So let's look at the two ends of this spectrum. This is the Tausig-Bing malformation in the setting of straddling and overriding of the morphologically mitral valve. And again, you've seen this picture before, the mitral valve is also. Now, mitral valve now remaining within the left ventricle. The greater part is going into the right ventricle, hence giving us double inlet right ventricle, but with an incomplete left ventricle. It makes no sense at all to say that this is a true single ventricle because it still has a morphologically left ventricle position posterior inferiorly within the ventricular mass. So let's look at the two ends of this spectrum. This is the Tausig-Bing malformation in the setting of straddling and overriding of the morphologically mitral valve. And again, you've seen this picture before, the mitral valve is also cleft. It's opening to the right ventricle between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation, because in this instance, we also have double outlet from the right ventricle, but with concordant atrioventricular connections. This, however, is the other end of the spectrum. So I'm showing you here the situation where the right atrioventricular valve, all of the circumference of the left atrioventricular valve is committed to the dominant right ventricle. But is this a single ventricle? Of course it isn't, as when we look posterior inferiorly within the ventricular mass, unequivocally we find with straddling mitral valve an incomplete left ventricle. And it makes no sense at all to argue that this is anything but a left ventricle. It's a morphologically left ventricle, but it is incomplete because it lacks not only its inlet, larger part of the inlet committed to the right ventricle, but also its outlet, because this heart has double inlet, double outlet, morphologically right ventricle. The key point, the septum is still to the crooks, so there will be a regular conduction axis. The situation becomes a little more complex, however, when we move to left-handed ventricular topology. Now, because the mitral Mitral valve is straddling, mitral valve is on the right side. The spectrum is going to be from discordant to double inlet right ventricle again, but now with a right sided incomplete left ventricle. And always now we're going to have an abnormal atrioventricular conduction axis, and that's because of the septal malalignment we find in this setting. And the anterolateral node will be in the right atrioventricular junction. Although on occasion, there can be better septal alignment, and then we can have a sling of conduction tissue between paired nodes. So here is the spectrum that we're looking at. Remember, we have left-handed ventricular topology, so the morphologically left ventricle is now right-sided. And if the smaller part of the straddling mitral valve is connected into the left-sided right ventricle, the larger part remains committed to the right side of the left ventricle, we still have discordant atrioventricular connections. At the other end of the spectrum, when 
the only the minor part straddling mitral valve remains in the right-sided left ventricle with the greater part committed to the left-sided right ventricle and we have double inlet right ventricle but now with right-sided posterior inferior incomplete left ventricle so here is the spectrum here is con congenitally corrected transposition with straddling mitral valve the morphologically right atrium mostly committed to the morphologically left ventricle but the smaller part going across into the left-sided morphologically right ventricle at the other end of the spectrum as you see here both the right and left atrioventricular valves committed to the dominant right ventricle there however remains the second ventricular chamber the incomplete left ventricle which is now tucked into the right-sided hip pocket of the ventricular mass so let me finish by telling you about this other arrangement in which we find straddling atrioventricular valve and here i say valve rather than valves because this is the combination where we have absence of one of the atrioventricular connections but with straddling and overriding of the solitary valve and this gives us a connection which is uniatrial but biventricular so it's giving us one form of double outlet atrium but here we must remember that whenever we have overriding of an atrioventricular valve we have double outlet of one of the atrial chambers but when we have the situation combined with absent connection this can affect either the right-sided or the left-sided valve and again we have the problem of ventricular topology we have an added problem here however because the valve can mostly be connected to either of the ventricles so it can be difficult to determine which ventricle is dominant most frequently we see this in the setting of absence of the right atrioventricular connection and i'm showing you here the situation with right-handed ventricular topology so this is tricuspid atresia with straddling mitral valve there can however again be a spectrum of override but always we're going to have the uniatrial connection so it will be the size of the ventricles that vary depending on the extent of override and here you see a beautiful example of that arrangement the right atrium has no connection with the ventricular mass the left atrium however because of the straddling and overriding of the left atrioventricular valve is committed not only to the left ventricle but also to the right ventricle and this is the arrangement we see of absent right atrioventricular connection with right-handed ventricular topology but we can also have the situation when we have left-handed topology you cannot however tell that by looking into the atrial chamber so when you look into this atrial chamber there is no way you can tell that this is not standard tricuspid atresia we discussed this last week and we pointed out that in the setting of standard tricuspid atresia we have a dimple in the floor of the right atrium and that is exactly what you see here but this is an unusual heart because now when we look on the other side and when we look into the left atrium we see that the left atrium is not now draining through a mitral valve but is draining through a tricuspid valve that is mostly connected to the morphologically right ventricle there is a small part however that is going into the right-sided inferior morphologically left ventricle because this is straddling and overriding solitary atrioventricular valve and a heart with absent right atrioventricular connection but left-handed ventricular topology and here is the other side of the coin 
because this heart again has absence of an atrioventricular connection. You see this time, however, that it is the right atrium that is connected into both of the ventricular chambers. The left atrium now has a muscular floor with absence of the left atrioventricular connection. But now it is the right atrioventricular valve, here in the setting of right-handed ventricular topology, that is straddling and is also overriding. Part of the valve connected to the left ventricle, part of the valve connected to the right ventricle. Now it is tempting to think that this valve looks very much like a common valve, but it cannot be a common valve because it is draining only the morphologically right atrium. It is a right atrioventricular valve. We're dealing here with right-handed ventricular topology. It is straddling tricuspid valve in the setting of absence of the left atrioventricular connection. So to put everything together, straddling valves comprise a very complex group of malformations, and they pose many questions. But when we concentrate on the anatomy, we can answer all of those questions. So when you come across patients with these lesions, you have to determine, first of all, is the valve straddling? Is it also overriding? We then have to determine is it a mitral valve? Is it a tricuspid valve? And that is going to depend on the ventricular topology. And rarely, both valves can straddle and override. So again, right-handed as opposed to left-handed ventricular topology becomes key in resolving these questions. But don't forget that common valves can also override a straddle and as I've shown you, so can a solitary valve override. But if you concentrate on the anatomy, if you diagnose what is going on, then you can answer all the questions. Thank you very much. Professor Anderson, it's always a pleasure listening to you. And um, there's always something new to learn. At least now I know that straddling and overriding are mutually exclusive. Um, would I encourage us to type in our questions in the Q&A box and we would answer our questions live as much as possible. Thank you. We'll now invite Professor Norman Silverman for his um, comments. I can't start my video, but um, you have to do that for me. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Bob, that was absolutely outstanding. Um, the, um, I just want to emphasize one thing that you said, that tricuspid valves, when they straddle, they straddle through posterior defects. And I'm not sure that um, we said that when mitral valves straddle, they straddle through anterior defects. Is that uh, correct or not? That is correct. Good. So uh, I just think that's important to emphasize for the listeners that this is the situation. Um, the thing that I was struck about is that you have seen a lot more pathology in your career than I have actually seen echocardiograms in my career. That straggling is not a common uh, defect. Um, and um, I think that you did this very beautifully and, and showed us this uh, clear um, and um, vast uh, collection of what can occur with straddling and overriding valves. The, um, the one um, issue, of course, is that um, the, the issue of this solitary ventricle. And we had uh, discussed this um, earlier on uh, by email. I think that it's a rare uh, entity. Now, I think it may be less rare when you look at it in the echocardiogram because it's not easy always to find a ventricle which is collapsed as um, a hip pocket, either anteriorly or posteriorly. And so on echocardiogram, it may be much more difficult to make um, this diagnosis. 
And I think in a way uh, that uh, was uh, alluded to as a very briefly by um, uh, Dr. Merrill Cohen in her presentation. And uh, I think that the extensive nature of um, the descriptions that you've given us together with the diagrams has provided a very um, vast and complete understanding of what we are liable to, liable to see with echocardiograms. And what I think is important is that if I were to study a patient with an echocardiogram where there was a question of a straddling valve, I would repeat looking at your lecture so that I could see the spectrum. Because I think that what we have failed to do, <coughs> excuse me, as echocardiographers is to understand the complete pathology. And once you understand the complete pathology, when you then go and study a patient, you then can use that uh, um, background, that, that foundation, to really get a much more precise um, um, assessment of what you're looking at with the echocardiogram. So in that case, you have to look more carefully for a hip pocket ventricle or an anterior um, uh, type of um, diminutive ventricle. And that really is the, the real strength of your presentation this morning for echocardiographers. Uh, the thing that I don't understand though, Norman, and uh, you have to forgive me here because I was not, I did not hear Merrill's presentation, but I'm <laughs> given to understand that Merrill suggested that in the setting of double inlet ventricle, we would always find what she called true single ventricles. Is that not the case? No, I don't think that she said that. I'm a, I, I, I don't, and certainly my, my recollection of this is um, very simple. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, Merrill is not here to defend herself, but that didn't come across as my perception. I think she did a creditable, creditable job at looking at the functionally single ventricle, but uh, this is certainly not a big point. And well, she but did it is a big point if we, if we are, because, I mean, I take your point that on occasion it can be very difficult to differentiate double inlet right ventricle from the solitary ventricle. Mm -hmm. So, it, but in that instance, even in those instances, if it is a right ventricle, then you would know it's not, you're, all the time you're going to be looking for the second small ventricle. So surely that tells us the, and the notion of talking yeah. about a true, the true single ventricle is the solitary ventricle. Yeah. And so no, I still true. don't understand. And, and we, we also come back to the situation with doubling that left ventricle, because as you know well, Richard Van Prague still maintains the double inlet left ventricle is a single ventricle because he says that the small chamber, which unequivocally is a right ventricle, is no more than an infundibular outlet chamber. We now know that that is not the case. We have the developmental evidence that that is not the case. And, he, and we all know that in fact, the normal heart has a single left ventricle. It happens to coexist with a single right ventricle. <laughs> so the notion of having true single ventricles in the setting of double inlet ventricle can only exist when it is a solitary and indeterminate ventricle. But is that what Merrill said? Uh, I think Merrill uh, sort of supported your point of view. I don't think that she um, talked about it as a single left ventricle. Well, I, I mean, it ventricle. is important that we clarify this because one of the things we're trying to do with the Congenital Heart Academy is that we're trying to bring uh, uniformity in the way that we describe things. So I think it is a point that we need to clarify because as I say, I did not hear the presentation myself, but one of my very good friends and colleagues did hear the presentation and he immediately came and he, he's, I, I believe he's going to be watching today. He should be listening today, Adrian Krushan, with who I work very closely, at Birmingham Children's Hospital. And Adrian gave me to understand that the implication was that you could now have true single ventricles as opposed to, I guess, untrue single ventricles. Yeah. And I, I, 
and surely the point of the functioning univentricular heart is that there is a spectrum from functionally univentricular to functionally biventricular hearts, rather than going back to arguing as to when ventricles become true this or that. I mean, there are ventricles. We have well, right I, ventricles, I, we have left ventricles, we have solitary ventricles. Sure. I don't think that uh, we need to ding Merrill. I thought her presentation uh, and, and the way she started off the presentation with diagrams, which are available in the book that she wrote, uh, I pretty much follow uh, Bob Anderson's um, rationality about how one approaches uh, the, the ventricle. And if she did say something about single ventricles, then it, it, it eluded me in my listening to her presentation, which I thought was really quite excellent, Bob. And I thought even the use of her words, hip pocket ventricles, which uh, you used last week, Indeed. Indeed. Uh, I think... Uh, she, she termed, and she also used uh, some of uh, yours and Diane Spice's uh, marvelous pictures of the functionally single ventricle, including one where there was a hyperplastic ventricle. The problem with single ventricle is it's a well-established term, and certainly a number of people in the world are still using it. I think that we have not used that because it's an imprecise word. But it's still, uh, unfortunately, in general usage. And by the uh, whole I think of our series of presentations is to show that we can absolutely. resolve the issue, at absolutely. least in my mind, yeah. by talking right. about the functionally univentricular heart. And then, as we know, hypoplastic right. left heart syndrome has functionally yeah. univentricular hearts unequivocally in the setting of but, biventricular arrangements. Absolutely. Can I, tell, can I say you something? <laughs> Yes. Right. I think that the, the presentation, I have the privilege to record and to see again the, the presentation of Bob. And as you say, what I think that is amazing is the superb approach. And as you say, something that is easily to see on pathologic, in a heart that is uh, without life, it's not such a easy to found in a beating heart uh, with a complex uh, anatomy, with the baby that is moving. There is, a, a, I think that uh, this presentation complete, really, the uh, univentricular, the single ventricle, it means a way how to look the heart and how many options you can have uh, with the, at, the, at the end, the position of the, the atrioventricular. So I think that uh, this is, as you say, a difference between uh, something that is mostly seen on the autoptic table, and it's very easy, probably needs time and experience. And we saw not too much case in clinical practice, probably as is possible to see very smoothly and quietly on the, on the autoptic table. So I think that we are discussing mostly of the same things, and as you say, is only the problem or uh, some uh, classification a way to classify this. Uh, the, I think the, that the last, the, 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 the presentation of today is superb. This is yeah. what I think. Of course, Thank may you I so just much. add I'm another little, you. may I add just one comment? I mean, yes, I think yes. that in the cases that we see usually of double inlet left ventricle, uh, my, my experience is straddling is most common in that particular group of patients. It's often a, a possible to see cord straddling. And I think that's one of the things that echocardiography has that no other technique has. You can't see it with CT and MRI, is you can actually see the dynamism of the atrioventricular valve as it uh, and its a setting across uh, the interventricular mm -hmm. communications. And so, again, I would make the same plea to my echocardiographic colleagues who are listening to this to think of these presentations that Professor Anderson has made when they go and study a patient where there's a, a functionally single ventricle and look at the atrioventricular junctions very carefully and see whether they can see straggling tenderness cords running across the interventricular communication because there's no other technique other than the direct surgical visual, visualization 
that you can uh, do this with in life. And I think it's most important that we emphasize that um, when uh, you do an ultrasound study in these patients, that you look specifically for the uh, issue of straddling uh, in uh, the setting of the functionally single ventricle. Can I make a, another comment apropos of what Sasha says? Because I agree with him that uh, it's probably the, the, uh, the finding of these entities in the autopsy setting that brings them to prominence. But that in itself has bad connotations. Because the very fact that we see so many of these lesions in the autopsy setting suggests that it's a very bad feature when you come across it. And this is particularly the case, I think, for straddling tricuspid valve. And I spent a lot of the time in today's presentation emphasizing straddling tricuspid valve, because I still think there are many surgeons who do not appreciate that because of the septal malalignment that you find in the setting of straddling tricuspid valve, the atrioventricular node is not where you expect it to be. Yeah. And one of the reasons that we find so many of these hearts in the autopsy uh, uh, setting is because surgeons have not realized that the node's in the wrong place, the patients have suffered heart block, and that's why in the past they didn't survive. I think that's less of a problem these days. But Norman, you will emphasize will you not, that straddling tricuspid valve in the setting of an inlet ventricular septal defect is not as infrequent as we might think. I, I think that's true. And um, I think that a lot of uh, echocardiographers have missed this because they don't look carefully enough for the setting of the straddling of the valve. And so when you see an inlet defect, I think you have to look at that. And we've seen a number of cases like that. It's also possible when the, the surgeon is able to recognize this, that um, uh, depending on the degree of, of straddle, uh, you can uh, relocate the uh, tenderness cords to the right ventricle with uh, Gore-Tex or other measures and close the ventricular septal defect and come off with an excellent biventricular repair. And it's in this setting that it becomes a real issue because in the setting of the functionally single ventricle, we have this cure-all operation, which uh, in Philadelphia they called the Omni procedure, because you can repair anybody by making it a single ventricle. And in a way, it's much more important when this uh, connection is a um, with a non-functional single ventricle, that straddling is important because their um, surgical um, um, relocation of the tenderness cords is easier uh, to uh, uh, achieve for a two ventricle repair. In a, in a Fontan procedure, it really doesn't matter whether the valve is straddling because you don't touch it. I mean, in, in fact, that's one of the questions I note that we've been asked as to when would you opt to reattach the tenor to undo the straddling? And if you do, I mean, Sasha, you might be able to answer that. Uh, we, we learned the lesson that whatever you cut, you have to reattach. It means we don't really know how much, thing, how much uh, it's very difficult to understand what is working and what is uh, you know, secondary. What is, uh, so in my experience, if I cut something, I will reattach. This is... Uh, You'd also take into account, presumably, the size of the small second ventricle. And yes. Then, and that is the key, is it not? When yes. you have to decide whether that in the setting of straddling tricuspid valve, does the mm. right ventricle, be, and if you are, ha, have that associated with discordant ventricular arterial connections, which can be the case, when the right ventricle is then supporting the aorta, this becomes an even more important uh, uh, consideration. So, Norman, what would you, what's your approach there? Well, I mean, I think that this is, um, my approach is this is surgeon's going to have to handle this. So I have to give him the best information that I possibly can. And uh, I think it's much easier to uh, reattach tenderness cords uh, in the right ventricle, which is a, when it's a non-systemic ventricle. I think it's harder to get a good result when you take a, a, a mitral valve that is straddling 
and try and attach that to a systemic uh, left ventricle. So that, that's certainly my approach as an echocardiographer uh, to uh, consult with the surgeon about these issues. And basically, I would throw this question back to uh, Sasha to answer because it's not a question that, um, you know, it's fine to make armchair decisions, but um, when I've had the odd occasion when I'm in the operating room and the surgeon turns to me and says, what do you think I should do? I start to perspire and sweat because I realize I'm now responsible for uh, providing some of the care on the patient. So again, I would, I would bring this back to Sasha to say, Sasha, I'd say there's a straddle of the mitral valve. It's minor or it's major. What do you think you can do on this? Well, there's an added problem if you have straddling of the mitral valve, because that's most typically seen in the setting of double outlet right ventricle, the tau Correct. No, so not do. only do you have the problem of the straddling, also the straddling is blocking the channel you want to connect between the left ventricle and the yeah. subpulmonary outflow tract. So that's, if you like, a double whammy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Sasha, that's a big problem, is it not? Yes. We know in uh, clinical, uh, it means in surgical practice, that this is a sort of a chill ill of, uh, of this type of uh, correction. But uh, of course, uh, generally, as I told you, when, whatever, of course, we add now, we have uh, opportunity to have CT scan, MRI, we can study a lot rather than uh, stop with the uh, echography. So we can uh, really plan the, the, the correction. I really, it means we try to offer all the time biventricular repair. This is something obvious. But at the same time, when uh, it, whatever is possible, if you see that is a, also, if it's a big uh, uh, single papillary muscle, we try to reimplant, to detach and reimplant uh, in the left ventricle. We know that uh, sometimes it's very risky. I mean, that has to be a big problem. And in, in when you have uh, in the tau bing malformation, yes. you have to take yeah. the, ten, the straddling tension apparatus out of the way. Then you have to connect the uh, interventricular communication up to the pulmonary trunk. That's a lot of surgery, isn't it? And in those instances, you might well <laughs> be better off opting for the, the uh, Fontan approach. Yeah, what well, I think that is very important, sorry, is the age of patient. I think that if you are able to let them grow, you can take a better uh, decision. Yes, certainly, Bob, in, in that setting uh, that you just described in the Tausig Bing malformation, uh, sometimes the, the obstruction to the now neo aortic outflow is obstructed. And uh, you have to really um, take um, and do a prostate, remove the whole left atrioventricular valve and put in a prosthetic valve. And as you can imagine, that procedure in, the, uh, in a small child is a, yeah. a disastrous procedure when you come to this. And I have uh, patients in my autopsy collection, I think you've actually seen that, where this has certainly been the case. And when you look at the left ventricular outflow tract that's been repaired in this situation, you see nothing because the whole atrioventricular valve that was straddling and was attached has been removed. And all you have is a prosthetic valve to look at. So it's really a disastrous situation. Yes. And, and in a way, the, the discussions we're having at the moment comes back to what Sasha said originally, that although straddling valves are rare, the reason that we see so many of them in the autopsy suite is because they create so many complications. So yep. although they are rare and although they are complex, and I accept totally that it's a very complex uh, topic, it's crucial that we understand them because if we do understand them, then I don't think the anatomy then becomes difficult to understand. Well, Thank you. There is some question. Take some of the questions in the Q and A box. So the first one is from Yasser Ahmad. Do both atrioventricular valves in double inlet left ventricle have the morphology of the mitral valve? It's a very good question because the answer is yes, but one of them tends to be more tricuspid-like. 
And this brings you back to the situation where you can have straddling of either of the valves in the setting of double inlet left ventricle. And the one that straddles into the morphologically right ventricle is more is obviously then the tricuspid valve. So when you have pure double inlet left ventricle, then they are very mitral-like. The more straddle that you get into the incomplete right ventricle, the more easier it is to recognize that it is a tricuspid valve that is straddling. And I mean, the problem with double inlet left ventricle is it's difficult always to work out the uh, ventricular topology when you have pure double inlet left ventricle, because sometimes the incomplete right ventricle is directly anterior. And then you look in the dominant ventricle, both of the valves do look like mitral valves. You don't know whether the incomplete right ventricle is right-sided or left-sided, and it can be very difficult to work out the topology. But in the setting of today's discussion, you are able to work out which of the valves is the tricuspid valve, because that's the one that's going to be straddling. You know, the minute you find that little ventricle, if you're lucky enough to find it, you then the other ventricle is going to be of the opposing morphology. Okay. So when you find that ventricular chamber anteriorly, it's usually a morphologically right ventricle or remnant of the right ventricle. Then the other ventricle is by perforce going to be a left ventricle. And when you find a ventricle and you find a little hip pocket ventricle at the back of the heart, that's usually the morphologically left ventricle. So the big ventricle, the dominant ventricle is going to be right-sided. I, I apologize to you thank all, but you. I have to go to another meeting. So I'll thank you very much. And thank you, Bob, for an amazing series. I know we've used the word amazing, but I, I have never seen a spectrum of the cases that have been shown and the rationality of your description uh, in, in the last five weeks. Well, uh, it, it's been a great experience. And I hope the Congenital Heart Academy will keep these on their website for a long time. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Prof Norman. Thank you. Prof, we'll just take one last question. And it says Can you please elaborate the Rastelli classification of straddling? I think that will refer to atrioventricular, um, common atrioventricular valve. Indeed, you're correct, because the Rastelli classification was uh, depended on the extent of straddling, and we can really call it straddling because it is, it's, it's overriding also, but it's the extent to which the superior bridging leaflet is attached within the right ventricle, as you say, in the setting of atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular valve. And with minimal override, then that is Rastelli type A, and then the straddling component is attached just over the septal crest. It's attached to the medial papillary muscle. And the intriguing thing about the Rastelli classification is that when you look at a large series of autopsy specimens, from the point that Sasha made here, it's much easier to see this in the autopsy specimen than it is in during life, but it is the medial papillary muscle that moves down the septum. And it follows that the more the medial papillary muscle moves down the septum, the more the superior bridging leaflet is going to get into the right ventricle. And the Rastelli B, which is the rarest variant, has the medial papillary muscle halfway down the septum. The Rastelli C, which has the greatest degree of override of the superior bridging leaflet into the right ventricle. In fact, the medial papillary muscle and the anterior papillary muscle fuse together. And that is what you typically see in double outlet right ventricle and also in tetralogy. I've never seen a tetralogy with other than type C override or Rastelli type C. So it is the extent of the superior bridging leaflet, the extent to which it straddles into the right ventricle that determines the Rastelli classification. But we have to remember that the Rastelli classification only depends on the superior bridging leaflet. The inferior bridging leaflet typically is balanced between the ventricles, but it does both straddle and it overrides. But the Rastelli is for the superior bridging leaflet.
Thank you very much, Prof. It's always such a pleasure to um, listen with you, in, into you. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined us from all over the world, especially those who have taken out time from their sleep to be with us. And we appreciate you all from all over the world, Iran, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank well, you. thank you, Ogo, for chairing us today and for doing such a nice job. It's good to see you from Lagos. As I discussed, I've never been to Lagos, so nice to see you joining us from West Africa. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank we'll you, see you Bob. next week. We can go ahead with uh, Isomeris on uh, 16, and uh, we start with a new way Indeed. to look at congenital heart disease. Cheers to everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye, you all. Everyone. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you.